The house was something out of a nightmare. The girl, something out of a dream. The house was old and strangely ugly. The girl was young and strangely beautiful. <laughs> Theater 5 presents The Nameless Day. Another day of rain. Why is it that when it rains, I'm reminded of a thing? Not distinctly, never in detail, not even where or how or when it happened. But I'm sure it was some time ago. Yes, it must have been because I've been in this asylum many years. different things might have been had I never met them. It was Canada, Quebec. I was ill. As I rode past Laval Prison, things suddenly blurred before my eyes. I got off my bicycle and stumbled into the guardhouse. Yes, I think that's what it was. I had fallen on a bench, weak with fever. Monsieur... Monsieur, uh-huh. this guardhouse is not an hotel, monsieur. It is not permitted to sleep here. Oh, I... I was suddenly dizzy. You are drunk? No. Excuse me, monsieur. It was then I saw them for the first time. Suzanne, austere, straight, and solemn. And Lorette, gentle, tender hauntingly beautiful. It was not until later that I realized, or thought I did, that I saw the man standing behind them, his beard fouled and matted, his face impassively brutal, full of madness. Was he there? I saw him later, I think. He must have been there if any of this is true. Do I understand that you are ill, monsieur? A, A low fever, madame. I've had it for several days. Then you need rest and food. Dorette and I have little to offer, but we should like to help you. Well, that's kind of you, but... Do not deny us, monsieur. My sister and I could not forgive ourselves. Well, since you put it that way, thank you. I have since wondered, although they tell me I shouldn't, whether the man with the beard was there. It isn't clear. It wasn't then. But I could almost swear he drove that cab. Lorette had not taken her eyes off me once. They were very beautiful. They were almost violet, her eyes. And she turned them shyly away each time I turned to look at her. Lorette, that's your name? Yes. You haven't asked mine. We do not inquire too deeply. Perhaps it comes of being so much alone. You will tell us, if you wish. I'm David Nielsen. I'm... I'm grateful for your kindness. Yes. Hey, dear, here we are. Lorette, you will take Mr. Nielsen to the house while I pay the fare. Huh? Oh, wait, Susan. Please. Come with me, Mr. Nielsen. Oh, uh, David. David. I followed her across a courtyard, fenced in by a high stone wall. She moved so gracefully. If she had not, I might have paid more attention to Suzanne. But even so, I think I remember hearing Suzanne say... Driver? Oui, madame. Take this. When the work is finished, we'll have the rest. Ben, oui, madame. À quelle heure? You will come at three. You should have, monsieur. Is it again the fever? Yes, I... I think the rain brings it on. Come. It will be warmer in the house. Uh, Suzanne will be up at once with something to eat. 
It is somewhat difficult with the kitchen downstairs. Ah, yeah. But we have always preferred this room. It is more comfortable. Do you like it? Oh, yes. It looks very comfortable. Do you... You and your sister live here alone? Yes. It is many years now. Our parents died when I was quite young. Oh, it seems so... So remote, with no other houses. Are you never afraid to be here alone? Afraid? <laughs> Suzanne is afraid of nothing. But we are quite safe here. The wall around the house is very high. Uh, you see? Uh, is, is that gate the only entrance? Ah, uh, yes. Suzanne keeps it always locked. <sighs> do you mind if I ask a question? No, monsieur. Why do you look at me that way? You have since we met. I do not know. Never before have I wished... Wished what? Yes, Lorette. Wished what? Oh, that we... Uh, that we had more to offer you, monsieur. I have brought quite sufficient. And the wine is chilled. Do sit down, monsieur. Thank you. Later, we shall make a bed for you here on the couch. It is quite comfortable. I don't know how to thank you. Drink the wine, monsieur. It is most nourishing. And very good. Monsieur, I... The wine is very strong. Perhaps with your feet. The wine is precisely what you need, Lorette. You must find it lonely here. So far from everyone. No, we do not mind. And our nearest neighbor would supply little comfort. Why? It is a surgical college, monsieur. Please, do not talk about it, Suzanne. My sister is easily disturbed. She seems to believe the... The quite lurid stories one hears about the place. Eh bien, we must make the bed, Lorette. I will get the comforter. Yes, Suzanne. As she went about the room preparing the couch for me, I could think of nothing but the softness of her eyes, the ethereal grace of her movements. I was captivated. Lorette... Is she always so, so overbearing? She is very strong-willed, but she is all I had ever had. No friends? We do not go much among people. But you should. You have a right to enjoy life. Oh, how oh, I should love that. But it, it's not possible, David. There is so much you do not know. So much I... I could not tell you. I won't ask. But don't stay here and wither. But I have stayed. And I have withered. That is the way it was. That is the way it must be. Was? What is past. Does that not condition what is in the future? Oh, if you had come sooner... If only you had asked me long ago. Long ago? Please, listen. You must leave at once. You must leave. I have brought you a comforter, monsieur. We rise early. If you should hear us, do not let it disturb you, huh? Nothing could disturb me tonight. So then, perhaps Monsieur Nielsen is well enough and wishes to leave? Do you propose that he walk to the city at this hour? Ah, we are keeping him from sleep. Good night, monsieur. Good night. Sleep well, Lorette. You must forgive her. My sister is recovering from a severe illness. Until morning. You will understand, of course, that all this was filtered through fever... I was not well, and some of what I report may not be true. But it is true as I remembered it then and now. As for what happened next, I have, I believe, a total recall. No doubt because I was horrified. I lay on the couch, fully clothed, 
thinking of what had happened. A kind of anxiety nagged at me. I got up, paced the room. I stopped before an old print hanging on the wall. It was curiously revolting. An aged lithograph of a lynching. The victim strung from the hayloft beam of a grain and feed store. The singular thing about it was that the figure in the picture had been quartered. The arms and legs made separate from the torso by four slim lines. I moved to another print. This one of highwaymen brutally dismembering the driver of a stage. I turned it to the wall. I lay down on the couch, telling myself that more than half of this was fever. Another chill went through me. I reached for the quilt, a patchwork of flame, and caught a corner of it. It was stiff. I looked. It was stained. It was blood, dry and old, but blood. I flung it aside. Yes? Baby, open the door, please. What is it? You must go, David. Leave now. Why? Can't you tell me why? No, the gate is locked. But you must get out some way. Go, please. Go where? <gasps> I must apologize, monsieur. She has had an emotional disturbance. I regret if she has alarmed you. Go to your room, Lorette. No! You see, it is quite severe. Oh, David, leave now. We will see you in the morning, monsieur. Why did I stay? Was I mad even then? Or had I fallen in love with her? ever been ill enough to wonder where yesterday is gone or where tomorrow belongs? I think it was immediately after she closed the door, but I can't say for sure. I started back toward the couch. A board beneath my foot moved loosely. I tried to pry it up. It would lift and then slide back, but I got it at last. I put my hand into the opening and felt something there. An old wooden box, unlocked. I had to know about these people. There were papers, old and yellowed. Rings, about five of them. And three watches. I snapped open the back of one of them and read the inscription. You will not believe it, but the watch was mine. David Nielsen, 1910. It was inscribed to me ten years before I was born. How? Was this delirium? Where was time? Where was I? I snapped it shut, cold with fear. I knew I must get out now. I pulled at the door. It was locked. I searched for a key. There was none. She had locked it on the other side. Lorette! Lorette! Where was she? Suddenly, I remembered, you will come at three, she had said. I ran to the window, and there he was, the creature with the foul and matted beard. In his hand, he had a length of rope. His carriage outside the gate was not a carriage now. It was a hearse. Suzanne was crossing the courtyard to him. Through the gray drizzle of rain, I saw them look up to my window. Then they moved toward the house. I tore the sheet from the couch and ripped it into four long parts. In spite of the cold and the dampness, my shirt was now drenched with sweat. With my fear, the fever was returning. It all seemed less and less real. Yet I knew I had seen them. I knew I must get out before they arrived at the top of the stairs. I had tied the pieces of the sheet together. The couch was near the window. I lashed the end of the sheet to its leg. When the window was open, I threw out the rope of the sheet and then looked down. They were coming up the stairs. I took hold of the sheet and climbed over the ledge of the window. With the fever beating in my temples, I began letting myself down. Being a 
stranger, I returned by instinct to the outer walls of the prison. I must have run for miles. My lungs ached. My head felt separate from my body. Don't... I fell a few yards from the guardhouse. I dragged myself the rest of the way. I think I must have collapsed just inside the door. Monsieur. Monsieur. Uh This guardhouse is not an hotel, monsieur. It is not permitted to sleep here. I know. You told me that last night. Last night? When you said I must leave. It is not permitted to waste time near the prison. Come. No, wait. You must let me in. There's something I've got to report. Do you remember the two women I left with last night? Two women? You heard them. They offered me a place to stay. Is it the prison you wish, monsieur? Or perhaps the madhouse? Why? I do not remember two women. I have never put eyes on you before. But you have. Last night, they stood not right... last th- night, not any time. Wait, it, it, it's not possible. Do you mean to say you've never... No, no, even with a fever, it couldn't have been just... Well, in the name of heaven, will you listen to me? You, you don't seem to understand. I've got to report two murderers. Monsieur, if you make a joke, you will have more than you ask of the prison. Come. We see the police judge. Why do you Americans come to Canada to go insane, huh? Now then, Mr. Neeson, I do not know quite how to deal with you. I have tried to listen to your story with an open mind, but... You will forgive me, I find it somewhat difficult not to say bizarre. Then why don't you send someone to find the house, find them? One moment, Timothy. You have never been in Quebec before? Never. You have never read anything about our surgical college? Oh, never. Monsieur, you have described to me two women. You have also described the interior of their house most accurately. I, too, have a description. You will look at these, uh, these photographs, please. <laughs> ah. These are the two women? Yes. But, but the younger one had nothing to do with it. One moment, please, one moment. That is the interior of the house? Yes. Uh, I am at a loss what to do with you, monsieur. Look, I'm not well. I have a fever. I... That is what I suspect, monsieur. What do you mean? These two women, they have been dead for 20 years. Dead? And the house they lived in has been leveled to the ground, along with the surgical college. What? A number of people became uh, inflamed. Things were sad. The house of the women was burned. Now, hey, hey, c- come here, come here, come here. Look, 20 years ago, through this window here, I saw those women hanged. <laughs> None of it could have happened. I try to agree, but I have this watch inscribed to me, David Nielsen, 1910, 10 years before I was born. Where did I get it? How? When?
Theater 5 has presented The Nameless Day, written by Richard McCracken and directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, George Petrie, Connie Lemke, Evelyn Juster, Guy Sorrell, and Ivor Francis. Audio engineer, Marty Folia. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlasdotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. This has been an ABC Radio Network production.